we have come to the Q&A session. I would like to invite all the panelists, uh, Datin Anid, Datuk Hassan and also Miss uh, Chin to uh, to on their videos and uh, and also their audio. Okay, we have actually a lot of questions from the participants today. It shows that the, the webinar today is very, very interesting. All right. Um, the first question, I think this one is uh, for uh, Datin Anit. Um, many doctors are unable to defend themselves when medical negligence or complaint arises as there was no proper or complete documentation in the medical record. Uh, please give your opinion. Uh, and also there is a few also was asking about documentation and medical record, especially because uh, sometimes it has been illustrated through the webinar that it's very very important can you please advise us on the on this matter i think you can on your video maybe during the lecture only the the it doesn't really work i hope that you I can see your beautiful face again <laughs> no i'm trying to turn it on but i think my wi-fi is having this issue so i'm going to turn it off keep it off for now and i'll turn it on the minute i can switch to hotspot all right okay Firstly, about um, when you are in MOH, I would definitely say um, that MOH covers you for medical negligence cases. But what we were talking about was, uh, and Dato Hassan also alluded in his lecture, was if there is a complaint to the medical council, then there is no uh, MOH coverage per se. That's why, um, and there's no uh, assistance of legal counsel made available to you. So that's why we would suggest that even despite being in the MOH, it would be good to take um, a professional indemnity policy that covers you for such occasions. And there are many in the market now. You, you, you definitely have got an array to choose from and specifically those within the MOH. Um, would you like to add to that? Uh, yeah, I, I've seen a few people in uh, MOH who were called up by MMC Council for the cases. And the NARA and the MOH says that they are on their own. So they have to go and find their own legal advisor or legal aid to come with them when they uh, go to the council. In contrast, if you're in private practice, you have medical indemnity, your medical indemnity insurers will assist you, will tell you what's going to happen, come with you to the MMC meeting and things like that. Uh, I've done that, I, I, I've gone through that and one, one, my Zwara, who's now the High Court uh, judge in Malacca, she assisted me in all these things, which was quite helpful because to be called to an MMC uh, and have no idea how the things are going to be done, you're completely clueless. It's like going to the court for the first time with nobody telling you what's going to happen. Uh, so for MMC uh, cases for, people, for doctors in MOH, they're completely lost because even the Pengara cannot help you because he has never been there before. All right. Uh, about the uh, medical records and documentation, what is the best chronology? You know, sometimes we tend to, I think in practice, Dato, you know, sometimes we tend to slack about this. And we know that it's actually a legal document. Uh, but sometimes we just cannot help it. We, do you have any suggestion or from any of the panelists who would like to comment on that? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, sorry. I know in emergencies, a lot of us do not have time to write down. It is okay during the emergencies, during critical periods, do what you have to do. Come back later and write. That is very important. A lot of people forget to write. And then the, the sad part is that the patient gets transferred to a different hospital. Then you completely lose that opportunity to document. It's okay to come back and write and you can write down post uh, post resuscitation or post whatever you've done in an emergency and you write down. 
And I always take a picture of what I've written down. Because a lot of times things get lost, especially in static chats. <laughs> It's true, and also when the litigation comes true, came to you, it's like years after that. It's not immediately. So any 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 advice? I just add something on that, and maybe this might happen. I think my 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 fellow litigators will share this view. Good case recording, good case. Uh, so so case recording, so so chances of defending yourself. No records, no case. Right, and I, I think if that's a mantra that uh, doctors develop in terms of prioritizing records, uh, what Dato Hassan says is spot on. You can do retrospective notes. Make sure that you write down the date and time you're doing it. Because if, as you say, Prof Azarina, people realize this only a few years later and do retrospective notes a few years later, it is not going to have any weight. You know. Um, I, I believe one doctor once in the same day had different handwriting for the same patient. And from the other side of the table, we could see that he had used a different pen. Those were the days when it was before electronic records. And we said, if we can see the different pen use, anybody else can see it as well. You know, so these are the, these are the small things. You, someone has quickly written in a little thing. Just the color of the pen can change. The level of the case. <laughs> And uh, just, just to remind you all that if you did not record down, uh, expert witnesses and things like that will go back to the nursing notes and look. Nursing notes are very, very good compared to doctor's notes. And if you did not write down, they go to nursing notes. It's very good. It can, I, uh, I can extract things up. But a lot of times, nursing notes do not reflect what actually happens. I agree that that's a dangerous part. I agree. In fact, that um, that case study that I gave during my presentation about the endocrine surgeon, the clucking of the temperature, blood pressure was done by the 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 nurse. That was done in the presence of the doctor, and that's what saved the doctor that he had done some physical examination. That shows uh, how important the documentation is. We wish all the hospital in Malaysia will have an electronic documentation, but uh, one day, uh, I, but at the moment, I think it's still a long way to go. All right, so we go to the next question. Um, the question is, if a house officer commits a medical error, are the medical officer or specialist of the patient liable to it? Any of the panelists would like to, to answer this question? I can try. <laughs> okay. To, uh, there is a specific case about that. I can't remember the name of the case. Uh, a house officer is judged according to the house officer's standard, what he can do. And if he cannot do that, he has to refer to his medical officer. And if his medical officer will have to work according to his medical officer's standard, and if he thinks that there's something that is not right, he has to refer to a specialist or consultant. So that is how the line goes up. There is a case specific for this. A child comes in, and they need to put an umbilical catheter to measure PO2 to, re to prevent uh, retrolamical fibroplasia. Now, it was put in by the house officer. Apparently, it went into the venous rather than the arteria. That is the job of the house officer to put in, and he put in. But the medical officer who reviewed the, the x-ray knew something was not right. He did not escalate it. So the house officer, because he's a provisional registrant, was uh, absorbed by the medical officer until the consultants, they are all uh, responsible for it. Therefore, they are all uh, will be held responsible for it. I can't remember the case, but I do know the case is quite an important case. Here. If I can add to that, um, at the end of the day, again, there's a perception of exactly what Dr. Hassan says. They look at the rule, but being the government, they're vicariously liable for all, all the whole team, the whole team that is in there. So this is when there's an allocation of blame within the team. 
But from the patient's perspective, they don't care whether there was a houseman or an MO or a consultant. Um, if a mistake is made, and I think by and large, a lot of patients accept that sometimes things go wrong. They then expect someone else to have picked out the mistake within a reasonable time, right? So, so it's a larger question than if it's a houseman, will they be a uh, responsible by themselves? It, it's a much larger question. It, it's patient versus the hospital team in a sense. Usually when the suit comes in, the junior doctors are not named in the suit usually. It's the consultant, the head of the consultant, Panara, DG, Minister of Health. It goes along that way. So that means everybody is responsible, right? For But they have a different role. So I think, yeah, we, we have to make aware that actually we, we are responsible to everything that's under us, basically. Okay, uh, thank you for the answer. So the next one, I think the, um, is about consent. Um, being a culture variation in our society that is a close-knit family, uh, would you suggest also take consent from a spouse or a parent of a patient more than 21 years old for a procedure of surgery being planned? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Put it this way. Uh, the consent guidelines did not make arrangements for Asian society. But, but for Asian society, we cherish our family tradition. Uh, that sometimes conflicts with confidentiality. So the first question is to the patient. Do you want... First, we have to ask the patient's consent whether they want to share it. If they feel uncomfortable, if they feel unsure and they want advice and things like that, yes, we can invite immediate relatives to come in. But if they are okay and it is a sensitive issue, they do not want to share it, it is their confidentiality. If we invite somebody else in, then we are breaking our confidentiality uh, born with them, they shows that they in, in the future they will not trust us. So you have to ask the patients first. I agree. So my question usually uh, I seldom take consent now, but when I I teach people and I take consent myself, then my last thing is that number one, is there anything else that worries you or that you're concerned about this procedure tomorrow? Number two, do you want to discuss it with somebody else? Or you want to discuss it? Somebody bring somebody else to discuss it. And usually they will say, yes, can my wife do it? There are things sometimes which are sensitive which we do not want to discuss with them. We cannot take it upon ourselves to be the judge. Yeah, it's true. Actually, um, being in, uh, I'm not as experienced as you are, Dato, but I, I think uh, sometimes they would like to discuss first, you know, so before they, they agreed to the procedure, like us anesthetists, before they, they would say okay to the anesthesia type of the anesthesia that they're going to, uh, they're going, we're going to perform to them. So I think that is a very, very good point that you have mentioned. We ask the permission first. Maybe they also, some of them don't really want the the other or the family members or to know about this also. Yeah, I think that is uh, confidentiality is there. All right, so we move on to the next one. I think this is uh, from our colleague uh, radiologist. Yeah, um, in the era of defensive and imaging dependent medicine. Can Dato share your experience of medical negligence towards radiologists? Which is actually they are they are behind behind the scene, you know? <laughs> yes. Uh, I have not uh, my expert evidence have always been in anesthesia and intensive care. But radiologists uh, put it this way. <laughs> I'm not so sure which one which defensive uh, medicine you're, you're, you're referring to, but doing procedures in, in radio, number one is procedural, number two is non-procedural. Most radiologists do non-procedural, we report, isn't it? 
So that is not an issue because the internet and things like that, that's provided for. It's the procedural uh, radiologists that need to be a bit more careful. You have to be more defensive. Uh, I know defensive uh, medicine is very important in interventional radiology, specifically because you could die, you put a line in. I know some hospitals, they won't even touch it. They won't even put a line. They want somebody else to put a line, but they have uh, been very out of putting IV line to put contrast and things like that. But even if somebody has put in the lines for you, you must make sure that the lines are correct. It's not bunk, it's not come out into tissue. When you give the dye, you must always ask the questions whether they have dye reactions and uh, reactions to dye and things like that. And if you, the uh, important thing is if you are asked to do an investigation, you must discuss if you are, if you think that it's a better alternative to discuss with the person referring to you why they want to do this investigation. And when I was a houseman, radiologist, I said, why do you want to do this investigation? I get very upset. I'm asking for an X-ray. Why you want to ask me for an uh, Why I want to do an X-ray? But there are, uh, uh, there's a case like Birch and uh, University of London. The patient has an aneurysm. And they want okay. to they wanted to do an angiogram, and the risk was low in any return quite high. But down the road, there's a hospital which has installed an MRI. So they should look at it from the, from the patient's point of view. I can do an angiogram, but it may have a stroke. So why didn't I refer to the hospital down the road? I can do an MRI. So, they did not consult back with the person who asked them to do the angiogram. Maybe an MRI can give you a better picture. So with interventional, there are many ways which normal physicians or normal surgeons may not see the other things that you can do. So you have to discuss with them, can we do this? It's better, it's safer, and things like that. Thank you, Dato. Um, the next question. Prof, uh, Prof, sorry, could I just answer that? Because I think uh, Shalin and I were just in the midst of a litigation where I was defending a radiologist. Oh. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, uh, Charlene still carries on, but um, my client is <laughs> now out of the picture. Um, where there was a misdiagnosis of a shoulder fracture, it was a difficult uh, image to see. Um, but it ultimately, uh, Datuk Hassan spoke about the four Ds, okay. the, the anatomy of the four Ds, the duty of care, the, the breach, followed by causation. Now, uh, just because she missed reporting it, uh, the fracture was off the shoulder. She was then referred to, the patient was then referred to an orthopedic. It was a question of whether um, the images also followed or was there just a report? So the, the difference is a radiologist makes a diagnosis but doesn't do the treatment. It's just a, a referral for the treatment. So with the treatment is done by another specialty. And it, there is a co-managing situation. So there would be more than one speciality involved in this process. And the causation would be more than one speciality, not solely that of the radiologist, unless there is a situation of interventional radiology, as Dr. Hassan said. So we've, we've seen cases where um, they're, they're doing a biopsy and then something was wrong uh, in terms of maybe a lung lung biopsy and then there's a puncture. So it's a small risk, but it depends on that. Thank you. Datin, we lost you. Sorry, uh, which part did you lose me at? Uh, I think uh, before. Puncture of the lung. Puncture. Oh, at the puncture of the lung. So it depends on the consent. So it comes back to whether, when taking the consent, there was uh, there was a risk explained of a potential one percent uh, risk of uh, uh, a pneumothorax in that case. So consent taking is equally important for radiology when you actually see the patient to do intervention. When you're reporting it, it's literally images. You don't see the patient. And a lot of people don't realize it. We had one MMC matter where the radiologists were all taken to task 
and only at the hearing did the complainant realise that radiologists do not see patients. Yeah, I agree. Basically, usually, the radiologists don't really see the, the patient. Uh, it's only during the reporting. Yeah, um, Ms. Charlene, do, do you want to comment? About the right, the Just a very short one, Prof. Um, yes, I think one of the, uh, if the only thing I'll add is that, look, especially when it comes to radiologists um, and any other specialties, when there's a co-management of the patient, I think it's very important because we do defense work. The, the different specialties have to work with each other, right? So for example, as a radiologist, if you feel if you are not certain, call up, you know, whoever the treating doctor may be. Likewise, in the treating doctor, if you're not certain, uh, you know, it could be an orthopedic surgeon, for example, and, you know, you're looking at the images and you feel, hmm, not quite right here. Call up the radiologist. Because often what we don't want happening in court is that the defendants are pointing fingers at each other. So what you do actually is you are fighting the plaintiff's case for you. The plaintiff just sits back, looks at the doctors, and they're just blaming each other. And the plaintiff is like, this is brilliant for me. You know, so as the right, Dr. Hassan is laughing because he was a you know, expert in, you know, the case where it, when the defendants all have a united defense, there really is power in that. Uh, that's all I would add. All right. Thank you. That is a very valuable advice to all of us. Before we go to court, we must have a discussion among the doctors first. Uh, then only we go, it, then we can, you know, uh, have the same uh, the wavelength or thoughts about how to handle the case. All right. Um, the same doctors that uh, was asking about advice or flow guide to doctors interested to taking up health care and medical law. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, you can do it out of interest. Uh, you don't have to do courses and things like that. But if you really would like, like, I mean, I did it because my ultimate thing is to go and teach doctors. But when I started master's in law, Shanti was one of my lecturers. And she asked me specifically, why are you doing this course? <laughs> Which is not to career advance me because I'm doing cardiac anesthesia, not many people are doing like that. But I told her very specifically, I said, I want to do medical law so that I can go back to university and teach doctors not to do mistakes when they come up. That was my main aim. If you're going to do that, then you go and enroll yourself and learn about it. And in Malaysia, uh, I, I did it in Malaysia because I inquired from the MQA if I did, because there are a lot of courses overseas, uh, Liverpool, Manchester, and things like that, and uh, Edinburgh, and things like that. But they say if you do entirely online, uh, they will not recognize. That was at that time, before the COVID era. So I had to look for a course in Malaysia that, uh, that offers medical law or ethics as a subject in this country. At that time, there was none. And Taylor's University was the first one to introduce it. And I became the first candidate. There were three of us. Three of us started the course. So I was the first batch of masters in, in law at that time. Now UITM has started it also. They have a master in ethics and medical law, which I lecture in the medical law uh, uh, area. So there are two uh, two universities in this country that offer medical uh, medical law as a specialty for doctors to to, to go and learn. Uh, U UIA used to have a diploma in medical law by a prof, but I think somehow it got discontinued. So if you are interested in it, you can do it now in Malaysia in this country, and it's good because. When we do it in the country, we see local cases and we understand local cases better. And we have our counterpart, the Singapore Medical Council, we see the cases in Singapore and we can compare how the Singapore have advanced their medical law compared to us in terms of guidelines and things like that. So we can, uh, they, they, uh, doctors who are interested in it can do, they can do it locally or now they can do it overseas because of the COVID. Maybe the MQA may recognize 100% online courses and, 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 and recognize that, yeah, yeah. But I do know of doctors in the Ministry of Health, like Dr. Hatta in Sabah, he, he did his uh, in UK, uh, from a UK uh, specified thing. Okay, thank you. I, I hope that we see more doctors will do the medical law in future uh, with the, a lot of course uh, being uh, available nowadays. 
All right. So talking about the teleconference, I think a lot of it, there's a lot of question regarding that. One of it is regarding um, taking consent using um, telemedicine. A few of the participants asked this question, and I myself actually during the COVID era, we have one uh, patient who's a foreigner that we have to do it online. And uh, when I seek advice from even our uh, uh, hospital management, they also have to look for it, you know, it's not an easy, it's not a norm for us. So how would you advise on this? Uh, thanks, Brock, for the question. Um, I think this is recording the consent. Is it advisable, is it? Um, it's okay to, to record. Um, I think it is fine. But just remember that, um, and I saw one of the questions there, uh, you know, what happens if there's no consent? It's always good to ask the patient, okay? And I think as a healthcare practitioner, if the patient doesn't consent, I think it's um, good practice to honour that, uh, that view of the patient. All right, um, but you can always put in your notes that you know requested for consent to record. Patient did not agree. Now, with regard to a recording, remember it works both ways. So doctors always feel that it's good because the patients are always going to come and say something different. Now, remember if you record the consent, it's also going to record things you said, which may not necessarily be uh, appropriate, or things which you didn't say. Dr. Hassan was talking about omissions. So, for example, if you forgot to advise of a particular risk, which the court deems material or the patient says is important, and we review the recording, and really there wasn't an uh, you know, advice of that, it can work both ways. But a general rule of thumb, I would advise all doctors, when you are doing uh, telemedicine, even in your daily physical consultation, advise the patient as though you are being recorded. So you will never be surprised and you will always be on your toes. Yeah. Um, what if uh, the patient, the, what, what about the consent, you know, because um, like, is it, it is electronic consent uh, stand in court? Is it valid? Yeah, is it valid? Absolutely, it is valid. Uh, uh, there, there is a specific area of law where certain things cannot be signed electronically, but I'm telling you that consent forms don't fall under that con the, the exception. So it is valid. Um, it will stand in court, Prof. Okay, all right. That is a very, you know, a good answer because the, in the era of COVID, we actually, uh, there's to call the family members to come to consent for certain procedures. Sometimes it's very mm. difficult because they are quarantined. They also right. have patient under investigation and we have no choice but to do an e-consent. E so I think this is the time that maybe we should learn more about this. In, uh, and then, uh, you know, in our practice, I'm pretty sure in future there will be yeah. more absolutely uh, uh, e-consent will come in all right okay so the next one would be um in the era of rampant usage of social media uh, and some of the our colleague post patient face pictures regarding the stories in social media um does it consider breach of confidentiality of the patient yeah very simple absolutely it absolutely is a breach unless you have specific consent from the patient asking the patient for permission to use these images um, or any identifiable information sometimes you may not post a picture but you may describe the person and if other people are able to identify the person you can be caught by the pdpa as well yeah Okay, um, unless you have very specific consent, we've had to defend matters before the MMC where they have written um, like basically the clinic has their own Facebook page. Okay, then they had either success stories or like the before and after pictures, you know, that kind of a thing. You need specific consent. And if you don't have specific consent, I think you shouldn't. In fact, I think in one of the MMC guidelines, uh, the title escapes me at the moment. I, I'm not sure if it's audio recording or confidentiality. It expressly provides that you cannot even use uh, information or images of the patient, even if it is for um, education or research purposes. You know, so I actually have some of my Facebook friends who um, are doctors and they mean well, 
you know it's a it's a case where for example um the patient has fed really really well and they put the before and after photos and it's a really good messaging but um you have to be very aware of confidentiality yes i would also like to say something about confidentiality uh I'm not so sure whether it still happens now. In some government hospitals, in the intensive care, at the entrance to go to intensive care, they will write down patient's name and bed number. Now, that is a clear breach of confidentiality. Uh, it's still, I'm, I'm, <laughs> uh, when I was giving my lectures, so my hospital said, oh, my hospital still does that. <laughs> So you see that even down in I, um, even in IJ, and we used to do that when we started. You have a big board in front of the ICU, patient's name, bed number, and who's the doctor. Now we've changed everything to RN number, so it cannot be identified. Even in our operating theater, outside the operating theater, we have a screen. We say operating theater four RN number. What 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 operation going on? So that only the exact relatives know. Nobody else can know. So. It, it, you know, confidentiality goes a long way. We may miss all these things normally. If I could just add I also. Yeah, Sh sure, Miss, uh, Miss Yeah. Andy. And just to add what Charlene was also saying, uh, even if the, the part of the body cannot be overtly identified, uh, there are prohibitions on publicity. And actually, it goes back to the professional component of our professions, right? Uh, the confidentiality has to be something that conveys confidence in the profession. This is actually now a 21st century problem where we are all in a position where our professions are marketing, and, and I think this is where the, 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 the problem is. And, and uh, one of the, the issues that came up during COVID was when patients were in the wards and, you know, under ventilators, you can't recognize who they are, but people were taking photographs of that. Now, it has not really become an issue in the sense of it's become a case or an MMC complaint. But the question has been raised, how are these photographs being even taken? Some of these people may have died later. Right, so you've got no complainant. Should the nurses or hospitals of that particular ward have allowed these photographs to be taken of these people in their sad final days or hours? You know, and it comes back to our profession again. You know, uh, the, the 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 medical profession. The medical profession is equally uh, constrained by confidentiality. Yeah, the reason why you don't hear so many arbitration and mediation cases is because we can only speak about it in very general terms. It, confidentiality is to be our cornerstone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, this is another, it's the other way around. Uh, this doc, uh, doctor was asking, uh, they, he, was, he, he or she is working in emergency department, receiving a lot of calls from public and then uh, asking for advice. Uh, and the patient actually record the conversation of the doctors. So what is your advice? And then um, after that, if there is any complaint, what is uh, what is your advice on this? Thanks, Prof. Um, all right, now um, let's just go step by step. Is there a duty of care that the patient owes? Uh, sorry, the doctor owes to the patient? Yes, there is. Okay, once you take the call, there's a duty of care, right? Um, so, but let's also be mindful that the law is not very rigid, okay? So what's the standard? The legal standard as to the standard of care, remember I mentioned earlier on, is dependent on the specialty of the doctor and the circumstances that the doctor is in. So if you're in A and E ward, you're in the ED, Okay, it's already probably, you know, depending on what time of the day, what day of the week, you know what I mean? Um, and someone just literally just calls you out of necessity and it's an emergency. Rest assured that the, the, the law will take these factors into account. Okay, so do the best you possibly can. Um, ask as many questions that time permits. And if you need to give a proviso, as, as lawyers will probably tell you, you need to make the necessary provisos. For example, uh, minta maaf ya, uh, Encik, I, I'm not so sure of your condition. Boleh tak kalau Encik datang ke hospital sekarang? Okay? Nampaknya keadaan Encik agak tenat or something, whatever it may be. Okay? Or ask more questions because sometimes patients, they may not know what information to give you as well. 
All right. So just be mindful. Um, uh, then I'm going to go to the recordings. Okay. We've had quite a, bit, quite a bit of this lately. Uh, patients have just recorded and then they will, what they do is they will complain first either to the hospital or to the doctor. And then once the doctor responds, then they say, you see, you're lying because, um, you know, I have this recording and you said something else. Okay. Is recording which are taken without permission permissible? Either MMC inquiries or court? Uh, I've been trying to say yes, they are. Okay. Um, so just be very mindful. As I said, um, if, as long as you are, um, your doctor's hat is on, right? Just um, as long as you do the right thing, I don't think you need to be necessarily worried, right? So don't always second guess the person on the other line or the patient that's talking in front of you because that might interfere with the treatment and management of the patient, yeah? Sorry, Prof, did I answer the question? Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> uh, basically, you are responsible for whatever, uh, you know, whatever advice you give to the to the patient or whoever even the public was just asking for advice so yes yeah yes. that sounds scary though no but take <laughs> take refuge that it's in the context so for example if you go to court right and you say that it was a really busy day you're in you only had several seconds on the phone um i would hope that you know uh, and if you apply even the bolum test because there's a phrase that says um in the circumstances of the doctor right so all of that has to be taken into account yeah. So please don't be too worried. But yes, you have to be careful, but uh, don't be too, too overly worried. <laughs> All right, thank you for the review. Yes, Mishanti, you want to say now, something? I was going to say that, you know, in some circumstances, the call could be from someone who's not a patient. So there could be the good Samaritan argument also because you're just trying to help what to do. You know, so what Charlene was saying about asking the right questions, are you even talking to the patient? It could be someone who's talking on behalf of a patient. Then you know it's basically the game of telephone, right? You, you don't even know whether you're getting the right information. So a few qualifying sentences, exactly what Charlene was saying. Make sure that, that you close by saying, if you are not sure, come to the hospital. And, you know, hopefully that will protect you as well. Thank you. That is a very, very good advice, you know, because sometimes we just, uh, with the description from the patient, and it's, it's very hard for us to imagine what is the situation, actually, yeah. the real situation. Yeah. Okay, um, there's one question about termination of pregnancy for rape victims, especially those are mentally challenged and having intellectual disability. What, what is your advice uh, uh, regarding this matter? Any of the panelists? Okay, I think I'll uh, uh, yeah, that, that's so, it. With, with, that's some, it. with some part and then uh, let the rest continue. Firstly, when a person has a disability, they don't have the capacity to consent. That, that is the fundamental rule of it. So you either, if it's a child, you know that they don't have the, they, they, you need to get the parent involved. Uh, and if there's no parent, then the welfare department under the child act. So that is the process. Now, here is a child with a disability, but whether it's a child or an adult, that, that again is a question. Uh, and um, unfortunately, in Malaysia, we don't have a Mental Capacity Act or we don't have any guidelines that will, will tell you exactly what to do. And a lot of times you're doing what is in the best interest of the patient. And it's like a joint collective decision. Uh, and whether continuing with the pregnancy will, will actually affect the, the person, uh, will cause further uh, mental distress, uh, are they able to cope? So all questions that they probably will need to be uh, open discussion with all the stakeholders. So there's no, there's no specific answer. Um, you cannot just terminate just because somebody is mentally disabled. Um, again, it's a question of capacity. There is a movement within the disability commun community, women and girls with disabilities, to say they, they have got the choice of deciding what, uh, whether they can have uh, children of their own. There are those within the blind and then uh, the deaf uh, communities that say their parents don't trust them to have children. Um, so again, it is, uh, it is very much uh, depending on the circumstances of each case. 
Any other panelists would like to comment? Uh, no, I think I think Anil has captured the the, the point. Uh, I, I was just saying that right now, uh, our our colleagues in medical legal society are speaking on this exact topic in a in another forum. Uh, coincidentally. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Uh, the next question would be, I think, to uh, Mishanti. Um, the question is, can you explain what is mandate actually? Oh, sure. And um, is it compensation? So a mandate is the power to be able to discuss and make a decision. So it, when you come, oh, so okay, just to put it in a different context. When you deal with lawyers who come into a, med a mediation or a corporate party, so let's say the insurance representative, in order for them to be able to say something, they have to have permission from their uh, claims manager or the, the department that approves. So that is called the mandate. So if you come just to chit chat and you have no mandate, it irritates everybody who has spent the time and effort to come wanting to make a decision. So you must come with authority to be able to talk, authority to be able to make some decisions. Even if it's limited, it's okay. You must be able to come with authority to make some decisions. That's what a mandate is. All right. Okay. Can, I, can I just add on the mandate bit? This is what I sometimes experience in departmental meetings and heads of departments and things like that. When it is a meeting to have a decision to be made, the person attending it must be able to make that decision, whether he's the head of department or not head of department. Therefore, I remember one chairman asking, I was representing first opening quest, uh, statement was, this is a decision-making. We are not going to discuss anymore. This is a decision-making meeting. All those present should have mandate or be in a position to give their decision. If you are not, do not have the mandate, please leave. So mandate is you have the authority. Yeah. After the meeting, you have the authority to say, yes, I agree, I disagree, I do not agree, whatever it is. You cannot go back and say, ah, can I bring it back to my department? That is not mandate. And usually for mandates, normally the mediators or whoever's organizing the mediator will make sure that the parties know this so you don't get surprised on the day of mediation. So there is a there is a method in that process where uh, beforehand we will, we will make sure that parties get the mandate so that uh, on the day of, uh, say, a mediation, there's not wasted time. Yeah, I, I think that's fair, isn't it? If you can't make the decision, you come to the discussion, it, uh, there's no point. Yeah, okay. So the next question, I think it's still for you. Um, what are medical negligence cases can be solved by me mediation? Okay. Or cases or cases that cannot? Okay. So quick question, quick answer to that question is anything that has a criminal element, may be excluded from the mediation uh, basket, right? Give you an example, uh, sexual harassment, question mark, whether you can mediate it. Okay, so I say question mark because at different uh, schools of thought, I think that sexual harassment uh, can be uh, mediated. But for medical negligence, for example, um, um, uh, because abortion, for example, is illegal in this country. So if someone would ask me, can you mediate something where one person is arguing that it was an abortion, I would say this might be a bit difficult, right? Because if it is has criminal elements, there's no confidentiality. The the uh, whoever is involved in that, so criminal matters out of the child abuse, all that is out. But anything to do with anything else, from cerebral palsy to removal, wrongful removal of an uvula of a tooth, everything can be mediated if the parties are prepared to sit down in a room. So I will tell you for cerebral palsy cases, um, uh, the, the, the normal length of a mediation is about four days, either stretched over a few months because there, there's work that needs to be done before the parties are able to sit down. You don't have to go to court. You know, I think the record is $10 million CP baby case being mediated and resolved. Um, you know, so, so it, it can be, uh, so pretty much every case can be. Okay. 
Uh, thank you for that. Uh, the next one, we came back to the documentation. I think they are really worried about this. Uh, is there any specific time or peri uh, time period that uh, it, uh, we should take in consideration as per retrospective entry? So that means, is that can we do it like a month later or so? So is there any specific time or any advice on this? I think we will have to go with the golden rule as soon as possible. <laughs> and if you are, as Dato Hassan pointed out something very, very important. If your, your priority is your patient, not your defense to a potential negligence. Right? If you leave your patient just to write down notes, that in itself is negligence. So yeah. it's all within common sense and reason. If you come back eight hours later after having worked on the patient and you just say, Time spent in OT, time spent sending the patient over. You can, you you can validly explain the eight hour delay. One month a bit susa. <laughs> Unless my colleagues have a different view. <laughs> um, I think uh, the reasonable way to do it after you have finished resuscitation, and. Uh, settle the immediate problem and things have been you know uh, look at the patient has been uh, all the resuscitation is over and then things are get uh, as soon as you can leave the patient i think that is all should it be a reasonable time because sometimes oh, yes. resuscitation for hours for the patient yes yes, yes. That, that would be that would be very reasonable you don't expect them to do it any earlier um, the, the, the golden rule that uh, Shanti spoke about was also as soon as possible because your memory would serve it as soon as possible. It's contemporaneous. Something a month later will um, attract this thing of whether it's an afterthought, whether you've gone back, looked at it uh, on a wider scale, zoomed in and said, ah, I should have done this and then written in something that really didn't happen. Actually, with the aging process, also we, we sometimes tend to forget a lot of things. Yeah, yeah <laughs> including what we had for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's why I was saying up, uh, soon after we have you have resuscitated the patient, you know, you you should write the the documentation. Okay, um, there is a questions about. Okay. Uh, about consent. Uh, about the age of consent. May I know for children less than 18 years old and she got married, who will be the right person to give consent for the patient? Dr. Hassan is the pro. <laughs> we were waiting for our consent thing to speak up. <laughs> Definitely, Dr. Hassan. <laughs> okay. Uh, in this country, age majority is 18 years and above. If you are unmarried, but if you are married, it can be below 18. And in some states, you can marry when you are 16 and above. Therefore, the age of consent, 18 and above, is for unmarried people, especially women. But if you are married, you are under 18, you are autonomous. Okay, that, that, that's something new to me also, you know. I, I Maybe if I have problem with consent later, I will just call you, Dato, and ask <laughs> what is the uh, right way to do this. The yeah. problem is when we have girls who are pregnant under 18, unmarried, oh, okay. it means their parents have to give consent. But the problem is when they deliver and they have a child, they are under 18, they are unmarried and they have a child. And the child is usually in a young big uh, person, usually the ch children will have more problems in during delivery and the child will have congenital things like that. They are premature. So who gives consent for the young one? That is the issue in this country. Wow. 
wow, that's going to be very it's complicated. <laughs> yeah. So I would say maybe we should have some advice from our legal officer, isn't it, regarding this? Because we also have to protect ourselves in order to get consent for the procedure. It's, it's not easy. Okay, uh, I think this is going to be uh, maybe a few last questions that we can take. Yeah, there's a lot of questions basically. Uh, may I know who will hire a mediator in a medical dispute? How will the, how will the charges be? And in a usual scenario from your experience, how has the medical dispute resolved usually and how long usually will be the discussion and conflict to go on? Yes, the multi multi parts to that question yes, very yes. quickly. I think I think the the second part you have already answered just now. You know a little yeah. bit. Maybe the first one. First part, all right. to the mediator. So actually, anybody anybody can start the conversation about mediation, but typically plaintiffs, patients who go to plaintiff lawyers may not necessarily be um, advised to, to consider mediation unless the law firm is a mediate preferred or a mediate first law firm. So. Like I said, anyone can suggest it. But what has happened in the past is uh, when they did defense work doctors and all that, the insurance company who have the insurance companies who have been supportive of SWIFT settlements do allow for the appointment of the mediator. They pay for the appointment of the mediator as well, because it takes one important part of the out of the equation. Because when you have an unhappy patient who has already spent loads of money in on hospital bills, the last thing it, they want to spend money on a mediator. So this needs to be big, big picture thinking by hospitals and, and doctors to say, okay, we believe we have a strong case. We will get you into the room and we'll explain the situation. And this has worked several times where the hospital has said, we will bear the cost of the mediator. Everyone come to and have a discussion. And there's no, there is no uh, moving the mediator to persuade patient nothing it's a very authentic process so where it has been used in my experience hospitals have borne the cost hospitals and doctors have borne uh, the insurers have borne the cost uh, outcomes i must say the the outcomes of the mediations i've been involved in uh, and this is not necessarily in court but these are at ad hoc outside using really properly trained mediators uh, has been excellent so um both in uh, from the the perspective of as a mediator as well as a mediation advocate. Uh, in fact, there was one very quick story I'm going to, which I wanted to share, which was involving um, stillbirth. Uh, the, the opening letter from the plaintiff law firm was for $5 million, right? Then it went down to $1 million. Um, and at that time, the insurers unfortunately said, oh yeah, this is just emo, right? And refused to do anything. Essentially telling the hospital and the doctors, let's wait for the suit to come. Uh, but the hospital, I must say, give credit to them. They were quite wise. They said, no, we want to resolve this matter. And we acted as their mediation advocates. We organized the whole mediation. We recognized that that $1 million was just really emotions on a piece of paper to be handled in a mediation. We appointed an excellent mediator who was able to navigate the parties as well. We thought it will resolve in two days because of the high emotions. This couple had taken three years to conceive this child uh, on account of something that happened, including the uh, missing CTG. Um, the child's heartbeat, uh, the child had gone through distress, the baby had gone through distress, missed stillbirth. But we were able to resolve it within the same day itself. And there was an apology by the doctor to the patient, which happened and it didn't get recorded in the settlement agreement as well. So there's so much. And when I came out, the hospital asked me, why don't you all do this more often? So I said, that interest to have a proper system to put this in. It cannot be on an ad hoc basis because this one was inspired by the hospital, not interest, sad to say. So I foresee that actually on the ground, it does work very well. I think it's a very, very good to know this, you know, because sometimes um, we are not aware of these kind of things uh, can be done. Okay, I think this is going to be our last question and maybe for the rest of the question, maybe we will uh, address to the panelists later and maybe you can email to you and maybe we can email them back to the participant. Uh, this is uh, actually qu happened quite uh, often in the hospital. 
do not resuscitate order for critically ill or you know advanced cancer cases there's a lot of uh, this term has been used um, if it's prescribed by the managing doctor but family members of the patient disagree and insist of continuation of care and treatment how would we handle this and any of the panelists would like to take that Dato? yeah can try. Uh, dnr is usually a consultation between the patient or the patient's proxy with the primary physician if it is agreement only then there is dnr and there might be witness some hospitals would have specific forms for this already some private hospitals said, I'm not so sure about universities or government hospitals. But I do know in private practice there is a DNR form. And the patient actually signs, or if the patient is uh, 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 given the mandate to somebody else to do it, then that person is the proxy and sign. It must be a legal letter. Otherwise, you make a decision without the patient knowing it, without the relatives knowing it. That means you are doing the decision on your own, which is not right. And a lot of times, I've seen this, the primary physician say DNR, and then patient has cardiac arrest, code blue announced, and the statist comes on the, on the list, uh, comes in, into the OT or in, in the ward, and the nurses say DNR, but there's no DNR forms inside there. That is not a legal issue. Uh, and that becomes a legal issue. If DNR is a legal issue. So from my point of view, like I said last, uh, in my last lecture, uh, uh, intensive care, resuscitate everybody unless there is a DNR. If you accidentally resuscitate later on, there's a DNR, it's okay. But if somebody says to you DNR and you do not resuscitate, the patient dies, and then there's no DNR letter, then you're in trouble. Patient can leave later on. Can, I mean, your job is to, if the patient leaves, can retrograde, but if the patient dies, you cannot make the patient live again because there is no DNR. The assumption is resuscitated unless there is legal DNR. Any other panelists would like to comment? Oh, if I could just add just only one thing, um, the Malaysian Medical Council actually has a section that's dedicated on this topic in their um, guidelines on consent. So I'm just going to ask all the um, doctors in general, please read through the consent guidelines. They're very long, but they're very easy to read and very uh, it touches on a variety of issues, including consent for minors. It also talks about um, people who are unmarried, who are below 18, all that. Please read through the MMC guidelines on consent. There's a specific section on this um, by and large, um, exactly what Dr. Dr. Hassan said. And just remember from a legal point of view, it needs to be the advanced directive needs to be so specific to that particular circumstances. So the minute there's a change in the circumstances, it can be argued that it's no longer valid. So if you choose to act on any advanced directive, please be very, very sure. Yeah. If you are in doubt, also remember that the courts are also an option to go and ask the courts for how you ought to treat the patient moving forward. That's all. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, our Society of Intensive Care also recently has come to guidelines uh, about uh, advanced directive. And to us, it's uh, quite clear. But however, we are not, um, we, so we're some. We are not well versed with the law. Sometimes it's still uh, certain things is unclear, but we are trying to understand how all this, uh, you know, uh, whether, how we should we manage this uh, DNR. Sometimes okay. we lawyers also are not sure, Prof. <laughs> You're not alone. <laughs> because that's why I, I, I've been reading it a few times and some of the clause I say, oh, I, I really need to, to read uh, or ask, you know, from the experts, you know, uh, about this matter. All right. So there is a few more questions. I, I think maybe we will uh, address it to the panelists uh, and email to the, to the uh, respective uh, doctors who's asked for this. Um, I would like to thank all the panelists, Datin Anit, Kor, Datuk Dr. Hassan, uh, Michelle Chin, and uh, Mishanti Abraham for excellent session. 
and uh, you know to open our eyes towards a certain aspect of the medical legal i myself learned a lot and thank you so much for spending your saturday with us throughout the from morning till i think it's almost lunch time already you know so thank you thank thank you very much we really appreciate uh, uh the the effort and uh all the time spent with us uh we hope that this is not the last time we're going to see all of you we would like to invite you again uh for uh, maybe for our next program <laughs> okay uh, I would also like to thank uh, my dearest uh, postgraduate deputy dean, Professor Norlaila Mustafa, uh, and also Prof Zarina Abdul Latif, a chairperson of postgraduate uh, PPD program, Prof Dayang Anita, Prof Emilia, and all my fellow colleagues, the committee members of the postgraduate. Um, PPD for our masters. Uh, this is the first time actually we done this um, program. So we hope that we will improve the soft skill, the professionalism, and also communication. That's been stressed a, a few times during this webinar uh, among our masters uh, trainee, and hopefully there will be better uh, inf um knowledge and they have more information compared to us i have never been taught this in during my medical school days and in fact when i was doing master there's none like dr hassan said so uh but recently yes this has been um a good uh progress i would say for the program and I would also like to thank the Secretariat who has working tirelessly since the planning of the program. We have been, uh, you know, behind the scene. Thank you so much for the Secretariat. And last but not least, the participant. Thank you for attending this webinar. And uh, we really hope that this will help you to build your soft skills and your professional de uh, professionalism development in your future career. And uh, with that, I will also like to remind the participant, please fill in the assessment form of the program in order to help us uh, to improve the program uh, in the future. And uh, don't forget, you need to write a report according to the department from the, you know, from the session today. Uh, the QR code for the CPD point has been shown at the end of the session and please scan it. And for the UKM staff, the QR smart attendance also is available at the end of the webinar. Uh, I would like to apologize for to for the some of the technical glitch of the webinar. I'm pretty sure all of us is still learning and try to adapt with the new norm. It's not easy. And uh, my recent experience with the anesthesia congress is not is is really is really uh, not a good experience for me. I I nearly, I think I, Dato Hassan is there with us. It's not it's not it's not a pleasant experience. I would say, but anyhow, we managed to overcome it and you know to to be better in future. Um, with that. I would like to wish all of you a very good weekend, stay safe, and thank you everybody for a very fruitful session. Thank you everyone.